Good morning. My name is Mike Quinton, pastor of Mesquite Baptist Church in Mesquite, Nevada. Thank you for joining us here on YouTube. If you are in the area or you live in the area, please join us any Sunday morning at 1030 or Wednesday afternoon at 1.30 for Bible study midweek service at 742 West Pioneer Boulevard, Suite A, like Adam, Mesquite, Nevada. And so uh, we would love to have you, love to meet you. And the last few weeks we've been studying a series, but one message every month of every year, I dedicate the message to our yearly theme for the church. And for 2020, the theme is to God be the glory. To God be the glory. God glorified in our good deeds. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your glory that we can, we see it every day and around us from a hummingbird to a, a honeybee to a, a bear rumbling through the forest. Lord, let us see in the mirror that your glory was meant to be reflected in us also, just like it's reflected in nature, even more so, because we're made in your image. And we ask that this message would bless today in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I get started, though, I want to tell you that I, I, I used to have a fear of speed bumps, but I'm slowly getting over it. Thank you. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Let me read this to you. Matthew chapter 5, 14 through 16 says, You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, under a basket, a bushel basket, but on a candlestick, and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's what I want to talk to you about today. We've been, every month we've been taking a theme, the last Sunday of every month, and demonstrating the glory of God. We've used the glory of God in the church. We've used the glory of God in Christ at Easter. Uh, we've used it in many various ways since we started this theme back in February. And this month it is God glorified in our good deeds. I just read you that verse. It said, to let your light shine so that men would see your good deeds. Why? To glorify the Father which is in heaven. This is repeated over in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. Did Jesus say that we're supposed to do good works to try and make the world a better place? No, that's not what he said. That is Satan's message. That is called a social gospel. We at Mesquite Baptist Church and other churches believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection as payment for your sins and my sins. That is the gospel. Satan's message is the social gospel that if we do enough good works, the world will become a better place and a better place and a better place. In my lifetime, it has not. It has gone just the opposite. It was a much better place when we were younger, back in the 1950s. You know, we were created in God's image for his glory. That's why we were created, for his glory and for his pleasure. Well, sin marred that image of God in us. But when you get saved, salvation restores that image. Believers are then indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. If you're not familiar with that term, God, the Christianity God, the one and only God, is composed of God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and God the Holy Spirit. Jesus died and paid for your sins and my sins, and when he returned to heaven, he said, I will send you the Comforter, and that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then indwells believers. Our desire, listen to this closely, our desire to please God grows 
as our understanding of him grows. That's why it's so important to trust Christ as Savior, but to be under biblical, scriptural, doctrinal teaching in the on Sunday morning, Sunday night, whatever time your church meets, if your pastor is proclaiming the word of God as it is written, then you need to be under that. I need to be under that so that we can grow and our desire to please God will grow with that growth in our understanding of him. That desire to please God will result in good works. Our desire to please God will result in good works. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We are saved by grace, by faith through grace, it says. It says, for by grace are you, by faith are you saved through grace, and that not of yourselves. That's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man or woman should boast. Well, one more verse. It says in verse chapter 2, verse 10, we're saved to perform good works. Over in Matthew 19, 16 through 26, we don't have time to look there today, of course, but there's an account recorded there of a rich young ruler who came to Jesus and asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life in heaven? And Jesus started telling him, Jesus knew already, what this man's response was going to be. He was a rich, young ruler, rich, very young, and he had every comfort you could think of. And he came to Jesus and Jesus told him to keep the commandments. And he declared he had kept all the commandments since he was very young. Eventually, Jesus got to what they used to say, where the rubber meets the road. He told him to sell everything and to follow him. And the man went away sadly because he valued those earthly possessions more than he did God. He thought he was a good person. Most people do. I thought I was a good person until I'd learned that I'm a sinner saved by grace. Are you aware that when you perform or I perform a good work, a good deed, it's a reflection of God's character and goodness to the world? It's what the Bible said. I read it to you a few minutes ago in Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light shine so that everybody can see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Because even they, the unsaved, know that the good works are not because we're good. It's because of our Father in heaven. So it's a direct reflection on his character and his goodness. And the world sees that. Having said that, I have to also say, are you aware that when we perform bad works, evil deeds, the world is also watching and slandering God's name? Over in Job chapter 1 is the account of Satan coming before God in heaven when he had access at one time. You realize Satan's a created being. He was Lucifer the most beautiful of all creatures. He rebelled. He was uh, ejected from heaven. He had access to God back then, and he went before God accusing people on earth. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? So Satan has access. The world is watching. Satan's watching. They want to slander God's name. And that's what they do if we do an evil deed. You know, every coin's got two sides, heads and tails. I, I say, and I believe the Bible says, it is biblically incorrect to say someone has been saved, but they have not changed. They're still being their same old self and not changed. And you say, well, that's between them and God. You're right. I don't know their heart. But in James 2.26, he says, faith without works is dead faith, that it doesn't exist. Dead faith has no life. It will have no reward. And so the Bible says that faith without works is dead works. 
Let me give you this example. We walk into a room, it's a dark room, we flip the light switch and nothing happens. It's dark still. We expected light to come on. So we have to naturally assume the, the light bulb is burned out or we forgot to pay the utility bill or there's something electrically wrong, the circuit breaker, something. But obviously, the light should have come on. I'm using that example because Jesus said we're to be the light of the world. If you have truly been saved, if you have trusted Christ as Savior, then there should be some evidence of it in your life and my life. Light dispels darkness. Light cannot exist in darkness. When a darkened heart, and God says, before we get saved, before we trust Christ as Savior, our hearts are darkened. When a dark heart receives the light of salvation, your heart is illuminated. John 12, 46, I am, the, I am come, this is Jesus, I am come a light into the world that whosoever, whosoever believes on me should not abide in darkness. So if you say that you've trusted Christ as Savior and you continue in darkness, either you're not telling the truth or Jesus is not telling the truth. I think you know the answer to that one. Uh, it's, it, Jesus is telling the truth. When you get saved and the light floods your soul and the Holy Spirit comes to indwell you, let me give you some examples. Your priorities change. Your priorities change. When I trusted Christ as Savior that whole week before, I wrestled with it saying, our lives are going to change. And they did. Thank God they did for the better. You don't know the joy that comes from knowing Christ as Savior until after you've done that. Before, it's push, 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 push back. But trust me, trust Him. Your priorities change. Your desires change. Your desires change. Now you want others to know of salvation through Jesus Christ, that you want others to know the joy that you experience through that. Your priorities change, your desires change, your outlook changes. Do you realize that for the very first time, you will see life clearly? That's all in the Bible, folks, that before we're saved, we're blind. We cannot see, we cannot understand the scriptures. So, life is seen clearly for the first time. If darkness continues after someone makes a profession, then we have to rightly assume that no light of salvation came on, that it was seed on hard soil. It did not take. Don't get me wrong. Although we're not saved by good works, we're not saved by good works, we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And if you are, and I am, we will produce good works. I read you a few minutes ago, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. No one, no one expects a baby to remain a baby. Everybody loves to see a baby. They, they express all the usual compliments, a beautiful baby, uh, so forth. But the baby must grow. The baby must grow, and Paul compared the Corinthians as babes in Christ, that they should have been beyond having to feed them milk. They should have been taking the meat of the word and using it. As the baby grows, it becomes more and more like, or should, like its parents, right? So after salvation, we should be growing. We should be showing forth a light to the world. And as we grow, we become more and more like the Father. Not to gain our way to heaven. Remember, Jesus paid it all on the cross at Calvary. So that's settled. But as we live this Christian life until we go home to heaven and we study and we pray and we worship and we sing and and honor of him and in glory, his glory, we should become more and more like him and more like the Father. And there's only, this is only possible if we abide in him. Give me a scripture, you say. Okay, John 15, 4. 
Jesus said, abide in me and I in you as the branch, speaking of a vine here, of grapes, the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you bear fruit except you abide in me. So you can't just get saved and walk out of that church or that street corner where you bowed your head and trusted Christ as Savior and never revisit and never study his word. It just will not happen. He just told us we have to abide in him. Let me say it one more time, several more times probably. Good works do not produce salvation. Salvation produces good works. But but the church down on the corner, they say we, we can do good works to get to heaven. If they do, shame on them because God says in his holy word, the Bible, that that is the way to heaven, that we are saved by faith, by the grace of God, and then we do good works. 1 Corinthians 2.16, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. What does it mean to have the mind of Christ? Have you ever heard that term before? What does that mean? It means to understand God's plan in this world. Yes, God has a plan for this world. You look around and it looks like chaos. And you go, nobody's in charge. No one's in charge. Well, God has a plan for this world. The plan is to bring glory to himself, to restore creation to its original splendor that we lost in the Garden of Eden and to provide salvation for sinners. That's his plan. It means we're to identify, to have the mind of Christ, means we are to identify with the purpose of Christ's coming. You say, what is that? He went to the cross, but listen to Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man, that's Jesus, is come to seek and to save that which was lost. He's not here anymore. He said for us to be the light of the world so they could see the glory of the Father. But he also commanded us to take the gospel into all the world and teach them and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So to have the mind of Christ means we're to identify with his purpose, to seek and save those who are lost. It means we're to identify with Christ's humility and his obedience. In Philippians 2, 5 through 8, very familiar verse. I use it almost weekly in here because it's so, so wonderful, but also so humbling. And it basically says that God, Jesus, God in heaven, emptied himself of his Godhead, humbled himself, became obedient to the Father's plan, came down to earth as a lowly human being, as a servant to you and me, and to die upon the cross for our sins. So we're to share that humility. Jesus said for us to take up our cross daily and follow him. It also means we're to share his compassion. Matthew 9, 36. But when Jesus saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them. Why? Because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. He saw they, just like today, you look around, nobody seems to be in charge. And yet everybody wants to be in charge. He saw the multitude scattered having no shepherd and he had compassion on them. It also means we're to, we have to prayerfully depend upon God, the Father. The entire chapter 17 of John is Jesus' high priestly prayer to God the Father. And you know who he prayed for? This is just before he went to his arrest in the garden. He prayed for you and he prayed for me. In the garden, he prayed to the Father about himself and his situation. But here he is in John chapter 17, praying for you and me. So that's the mind of Christ. 
came to seek and save that which was lost. He has compassion. He's their shepherd. How do we have the mind of Christ? 1 Corinthians 2, 5 and 6. Let's take a look there. 1 Corinthians 2, 5 and 6. says that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Howbeit you speak wisdom among them that are complete, yet not the wisdom of this world, not of the princes of this world, that comes to nothing. He says we are, this is a really sharp contrast here, I believe, between the wisdom of mankind and the wisdom of God. In verse 7, he says, in that same section in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 7, he goes on to say, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Verse 7 talks about the wisdom of God that was once hidden, that's a mystery. That was a mystery in that God had something he had not re yet revealed to all the world, but here in the Bible, he's revealed it now. So it's no longer a mystery. It's no longer hidden. That his wisdom is so much superior to our wisdom. And in verses 10 through 12, it says, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows, the things of a man, save the spirit of man, that's a small s, that's our spirit, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knows no man, but the Holy Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of this world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. Did you hear that, folks? I have no wisdom on my own, but once I got saved, the Holy Spirit indwells me. The Holy Spirit will give me, if I let him, the wisdom of God. I don't, I, I don't mean that to sound like I'm equal with God, that was Satan's downfall. He wanted to be equal with and better than God. No, not at all. This is opening our hearts and our minds and our eyes to have the mind of Christ. Verse 14, it goes on to say, but the natural man, that's the one not saved, does not receive the things of the Spirit, Holy Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The unsaved natural man, there it is, is blinded, cannot see the spiritual wisdom of God. So to know that this is how we can have the mind of Christ, have his wisdom through the Holy Spirit. Verse 15, he gives, the Holy Spirit gives us believers discernment. It says, but he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So when people say that as Christians, we are not to judge others. We are not to judge others in that placing ourselves above them. But the scripture repeatedly says we are to judge. We are to make wise decisions. And in order to do that, you've got to look at the, the good and the evil and based upon what God wants, make the right discernment, the right truth through judging. And it says here, the Holy Spirit will give us that discernment if you're a believer. So what are some good works then that we should be doing? Matthew 25. Let's look over at Matthew 25. And uh, have to say that I was convicted the other day because I 
have not done all of these things, as he said. Matthew 25, verses 34 through 36. It says, in 34 through 36, Then said the king, that's K, capital K, that's Jesus. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Do you realize this plan has been in place since before the world was created? Before you and I were created, God already had this plan for us. He says, for I was hungered, I was hungry, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. Sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Verse 35, some good works. Give food to the hungry. Give water to the thirsty. Give lodging to those who don't have lodging. Verse 36, clothing, clothing to those. And we have all kinds of organizations out there, both uh, church organizations and uh, secular organizations. Uh, Local food bank, we've got the Salvation Army. We've got all kinds of ways to make this distribution happen. Have you given clothing? Most of us have. We don't want it anymore. It's worn out and it doesn't fit anymore. It's too tight because it's shrunk, right? In the wash, that's what I've been told. Uh, Have you visited the sick? Have you visited people in prison? Have I? What is the good work? Those are good works. Jesus identified them there. Those are good works of believers after you trust him for salvation. What is the good work most glorifying to God? Acts 13, 47. For so has the Lord commanded us saying, for I have set you to be a light of the Gentiles. The Gentiles are anyone who's not Jewish, who's not Hebrew. So that is an entire rest of the world. I've set you to be a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for these examples from your word today. I hope it's been quite clear that no one has ever nor ever will be worthy of heaven by any good works they've done down here. There have been many people who've been put on pedestals for the wonderful works they've done. But Lord, your Bible is very clear that we trust you as Savior first and get that settled. Then we do good works so that people can glorify your name. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone out there today listening that does not know you as Savior, that the Holy Spirit has taken your words today from your book, your Bible, and convicted them and softened their heart and opened it to the gospel. And I pray that if they're willing to trust you as Savior, that they would bow their heart and their head and ask you, to save them and take them to heaven when they die. Lord, I pray this. You know that is my greatest desire in your precious name. Amen. Well, I hope today was a, a living example from the living word of God of how we can glorify God in heaven. And those are the things that we should be doing. Feeding those who are hungry clothing those without clothes, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison. But the greatest of all those good works is to share the gospel with someone else. I've I've mentioned that a few weeks ago. There's no greater joy than to lead someone to Christ and then watch them grow and help them grow in their spiritual maturity 
and see them in turn go out and win, and not win, but to witness for Christ and the Holy Spirit convict and people turn to you. Lord, I, I pray this for Mesquite Baptist Church. I pray this for anyone in this entire world and everyone in this entire world. You're long suffering, not willing that any should perish. Lord, thank you so much. Folks, if you're in Mesquite, again, stop by and see us. Take a look at our website, mesquitebaptistchurch.com. Take a look at our Facebook site, Mesquite Baptist Church on Facebook. Mesquite Baptist Church, Nevada. This is a Mesquite Baptist Church over in uh, Texas also. We happen to be in Nevada. So you have a good week. And if you have got any questions, use that contact information from the Facebook or from uh, the website. Give us a call. Give us an email. Uh, and we'd be glad to talk to you. Have a good day. Goodbye.